Hello and thanks for joining us from David Cronenberg's 1983 film about a future obsession with technology to a racy period drama and a celebration of Paris as a movie set. Welcome to our weekly film show. Television is reality and reality is less than television. I understand you've been taking the air lately. Perhaps a little more time spent indoors will do. La fleur d'asphalte attendra que le soir Mon marbre allume ses miroirs And I'm joined in the studio by film critic Lisa Nesselson. Hello, Lisa. Hello, Eve. Or should I call you Madam President? <laughs> That's an inside joke. Our top... No, it's not. Not for long. Our top film news this week is you've been appointed um, the president of Lumière, the Lumières Academy, which is the French version of the Hollywood Foreign Press Association who award the Golden Globes every year. You're the head of more than... 200 representatives of a foreign press? A little less than that. A little less than that. And you were voted unanimously. This sounds very exciting. Um, yeah, I'm kind of excited about it. Uh, and and it, it proves that people read the trades because I got congratulations uh, from people who were, you know, I, I haven't heard from in, in decades. Ah, and a big surprise. Uh, yeah, yeah, a very big surprise. <laughs> okay, well, let's move on. Um, our first <laughs> film this week reveals the essence of its plot in the title, but Lady Macbeth is a lot more than it says on the box, isn't it? Uh, yes, in fact, the, the, the more generic French title is The Young Lady, but don't be fooled. You know, there's many a Mac influencing Western culture and beyond. We've got McDonald's, Macintosh computers, but way before they came along, a fictional character established enviable brand recognition. That would be Lady Macbeth. Here, her name is Catherine, and she's played in a jaw-droppingly brave manner by a very young actress named Florence Pugh. Uh, I love this movie, but I can confidently say that it is not for everyone. An incredibly assured directing debut uh, by theatre and opera director William Oldroyd. It's set in Victorian England in the middle of nowhere, and uh, there aren't a lot of opportunities for women. Our heroine Catherine's options after she's been more or less sold into marriage are crushing boredom or crushing boredom with a side order of spots abuse. Um, not a lot of magazine articles about cocooning or working Pilates classes into your schedule. Uh, and be between the church and the land-owning and uh, servant-abusing patriarchy, prospects for self-actualization are bleak. When her profoundly pathetic and condescending husband uh, is away, Catherine takes up with a honky gamekeeper named Sebastian. How are you going to keep them permanently oppressed once they've tasted sexual ecstasy? Let's take a look. My father bought you. You think me to be stupid? You will alter your behavior. You're home. You've acted so very shamelessly and so very stupidly. You will never see that man again. Now, this is one of those movies that makes me very, very, very glad that I was born in the second half of the 20th century, not a minute sooner, and certainly not a hundred years prior. Here's what the director told France 24 uh, about his literally astonishing heroine. Somebody like Catherine was probably very similar in nature to a young woman in 2017. That actually, we, you know, those things that we think about Victorian England, well, actually, if we, if we had to investigate her private life, and we see Catherine in the bedroom, we see her with Sebastian, we see all those things that a young woman goes through in 1865, probably not very different. So we could strip back a lot of what we would think of as the trappings of period drama that we had come to associate with those TV adaptations that I grew up on. Well, there weren't a lot of TV series to watch in Victorian England, but there are now, which is why Paris hosts a yearly TV series festival called Series Mania, and it's in its eighth year. It is. Uh, you know, when the um, when they started Series Mania eight years ago, I wasn't sure what the Forum des Images, which is a city-sponsored archive devoted to uh, preserving moving pictures of the history of Paris and also a screening space, I wasn't 
I didn't know what they were up to, but it turns out they had a crystal ball because, of course, people all over the world are now hooked on episodic TV series, and Series Mania shows examples of the very best shows from all over the world. It is entirely free to the public, it's insanely well attended, and it is a spectacular experience to watch TV programs projected as you would a motion picture on a really big screen. Uh, I could bury you in statistics, but to suffice it to say that the programming uh, team uh, watches hundreds of films so they can whittle down and curate the best ones. They host public conversations with world-class showrunners and with actors. This year, for example, Dustin Lance Black will be on hand to introduce When We Rise, the story of the struggle for LGBT, etc. rights from Stonewall to the present. Okay, well, apparently the idea of a festival devoted to TV series has such cultural prestige that France are actually going to create even more events. Uh, that's right. Television professionals from all over the world already have gotten into the habit of coming to Paris this time of year for series mania. It runs from April 13th to uh, the 23rd, but it was announced quite recently that the city of Cannes is getting into the act, creating a new TV series uh, festival to debut in April of 2018, and that's not all. The northern French city of Lille intends to host a festival devoted to TV series in June of 2018, and the government has a hand in all of these. Uh, it's enough to make you just kind of want to stay home and watch TV. Yeah, well, I've just finished Big Little Lies, and I can tell you it's <laughs> absolutely excellent. Well, Paris is an excellent setting for films, and one place in particular that has inspired many filmmakers is Montmartre, think Amelie, and there's an exhibition at the Museum of Montmartre and Renoir Gardens exploring why this place is a filmmaker's paradise. Your Tell us more, Lisa. Well, I've lived in Paris for decades, but I'm embarrassed to say that I, I was unfamiliar with this incredibly charming little museum, which makes me feel like doing this. It's up the street from the vineyards that have been there for hundreds of years. Apparently, nearly 1,000 movies have been shot in and around Montmartre or using uh, studio facsimiles of the neighborhood's iconic streets and monuments. Uh, the Moulin Rouge, Pigalle, gangsters and prostitutes, artists and cabaret dancers, free-spirited youth, cobblestones, lampposts, you name it. Because Marmatre overlooks the city, filmmakers have always shot from the roofs and the terraces. Uh, I think it's safe to say that people all over the world carry a vision of Paris in their heads, even if they've never actually been here to walk around for themselves. The exhibit's curator had this to say about uh, the cumulative effect of what has happened sending all those moving images out into the world. He spoke to France 24's Renaud Lefort. It's true today that the real Montmartre, its cobblestones, its facades, and its stairs, it's there for visitors to see. As Montmartre is often depicted on the big screen, visitors expect to see a cinematic version of the neighborhood. Que ce que le cinéma leur en a montré. You're a lifelong film fanatic. Was anything on display new to you, though? Quite a bit, actually. Um, I've never seen the film Boulevard, co-starring a teenage Jean-Pierre Léo on a rooftop with a girl raving about how he loves the neighborhood so much he couldn't imagine ever, ever living anywhere else. Uh, I'll admit to some major gaps in my familiarity with classic French adult dramas before, say, 1960. So this show is a crash course. In this century, the French know Jean-Pierre Jeunet's 2001 film as Le Fabuleux Destin de Amélie Poulain. It rhymes. It was supposed to be called Amélie from Montmartre, in English, but it ended up being just plain Amelie. Now, I am pretty sure that I wrote one of the very first, if not the very first, reviews in English of this film for the American trade paper Variety, and I remember getting into this absurd argument with my editor when I said that the film, uh, that the cafe in the film is a real cafe that anyone can go into and that it looks like that, because uh, he believed that it had to simply be staged or on a set because it was too much like a real cafe to be a real cafe. <laughs> well, the show is on until mid-January, what was your favorite part? Uh, well, I liked just about everything I saw, but I especially liked uh, the photographs that are in the first room uh, when you start out of early Paris movie theaters in the neighborhood, including Dufayel, billed then as the biggest department store in the world, which in 1896, among all the merchandise, showed films by the Lumiere Brothers cameramen uh, just months after they had first been shown to the public in December of 1895. Um, in uh, the Gaumont Palace, which held 3,500 people, 
people and was billed as the biggest cinema in the world was another neighborhood fixture. The Gaumont Palace was torn down, alas, in the early 1970s. Back at the exhibit, there's a door upstairs on the premises because the museum is housed in a building where an awful lot of famous uh, uh, painters lived and worked. And on the door, it says, open the door. So I did. And inside is Suzanne Valadon's atelier, her workshop, which is every bit as much the cliche of an artist's studio as that cafe in Amelie is the cliche of a too-good-to-be-true cafe. Okay, and that show is on until January at the Museum of Montmartre in Paris. Now, we're going to wrap up with the re-release of David Cronenberg's 1983 Videodrome. Ah, you know, it's fun to revisit movies that were visionary when they came out and find out that over 30 years later, they're still visionary. Uh, this is absorbing, sexy, forthright, prescient, fearless storytelling from David Cronenberg. James Wood stars as the programmer of a pirate cable TV station, and he stumbles upon some tantalizing, bizarre, addictive images. He can't take his eyes off them. He finds himself at the crossroads where technology and human flesh intersect with hallucinatory results. Uh, if there was a channel you simply couldn't resist, but you knew you shouldn't watch, what would you do? And the way that it was uh, looking toward the future is, think about cell phones. Is your cell phone actually an extension of you? Do you sleep with it? Do you get very upset if you're not sure quite where it is? Today, of course, anybody with a cell phone and an internet connection can make their own sort of TV channel. But back then, the means of production were very much out of reach of the common man. This film is notable for its social uh, special effects. But see, social media is everywhere. <laughs> special effects by Rick Baker. This was pre-digital, pre-computer-driven effects. So what you're seeing is done with latex and foam and fake blood, but incredibly convincing because a lot of ingenuity and imagination. Nobody can ever accuse David Cronenberg of being short on imagination. Okay. Well, thank you, Lee. So thanks for your imagination. <laughs> um, we're going to leave you with that. Remember our website. We're also on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this. I think that massive doses of Videodrome signal will ultimately create a new outgrowth of the human brain, which will produce and control hallucination to the point that it will change human reality. After all, there is nothing real outside our perception of reality, is there? <laughs>